Hello and welcome to this presentation of International Plumbing Code Chapter 5. And in this chapter we are going to look very specifically at water heaters. Here we go. Section 503 goes specifically over the connections of piping to the water heater. 503.1 goes over the cold water line valve and states that we do need to have a shutoff valve for the water heater on the cold side. You can put one on the hot side and that's good. That's nice for service. But at a minimum, you should have one on the cold side and it has to be dedicated to that appliance. Uh, it's not to serve other appliances or say like, well, this one valve is going to shut off two water heaters or this and something else. Each one has to have its own shutoff valve on the cold side for obvious reasons. Come on, let's make this serviceable, right? And this has to be accessible and on the same floor level. 503.2 talks about water circulation. Many times in order to keep hot water out to the fixtures and so you don't run water for a long time waiting for hot water to get there, we recirculate it, right? You put a pump on there, it pushes that water around a little bit, keeps it warm out to the ends. But in order to have this installed correct, we must circulate that water in a way that it's going to go back to the water heater and be heated again. So the simple on this is you send that hot water out from the hot side, you bring it back to the cold side where it gets pushed through the water heater again to be reheated. It will lose temperature on the way, right? So we reheat that water. That can come in the cold connection on the top of a tank type water heater or you can connect it to the drain, put a T in where the drain is at so you bring it directly in the bottom. But either way, it needs to be feeding in in a way that will reheat that circulated water. In section 504, we get information about safety devices. Why? What could possibly be unsafe about a water heater? Well, as we examined earlier, there are a number of things that could go wrong. 504.1 gives us information on the anti-siphon devices. Let me give an example of the dip tube. A dip tube is the cold water pipe that pushes water in a tank type water heater to the bottom where it will be heated at the burner. Now in that dip tube, if you've ever seen one, there's going to be a small hole towards the top to where if there is a siphon created, let's say there's a reverse pressure and it starts pulling water out of that water heater, that hole is going to allow air to come into the tank, into that pipe and break the siphon before it drains out the entire tank of hot water. 504.2, a vacuum relief valve is required for some models of water heaters. This would be particularly for bottom fed water heaters. So if the cold line comes in the bottom, we need a vacuum relief valve there. 504.3 talks about shutdown, a means for disconnecting an electric hot water supply from its energy supply shall be provided. So if it's electric, we have to be able to shut that off. A separate valve shall be provided to shut off the energy fuel supply for all other types of hot water supply systems. So if the water heater is using natural gas to heat, we have to have a separate shutoff valve for that appliance. Now, I say separate because the gas valve itself is an on and off valve, right? The valve that controls what is fed into the burner. But that's not enough. We need a separate one to be able to shut off aside from that. So if there's ever a malfunction or a problem, we have a control. 504.4 talks about relief valves. These temperature pressure relief valves have to be self-closing and they are not to be used for thermal expansion. Now thermal expansion is when hot water heats up and the molecules are trying to spread out. If you're containing those in a closed system, it just pushes the pressure up. That's why we have expansion tanks. However, some have thought, well, if you just let it go off the temperature pressure relief valve, it's still safe and it's not a big deal. That's not what this is for. Okay, additional information about that temperature pressure relief valve, it should be in the shell of the water heater and within the top six inches of the tank. Obviously, this is going to be a little different on tankless because there isn't a tank and there is a temperature pressure relief valve, but it's not on the tank itself. There are a few differences, but on a tank, in the shell towards the top six inches. That can be on the side here or it can come out the top. 
504.5 states that a temperature pressure relief valve shall bear the label of the approved agency. So you know there's that dangly label that's always hanging on there. Do leave that. It's supposed to be there. And also it states that it should have a maximum 210 degrees Fahrenheit. By the way, that's only two degrees below boiling point at 212. And also a maximum of 150 PSI. Those are the two points at which this should open up. Now, most of the time it's going to open up due to high pressure rather than high temperature because, like I say, we're almost boiling at 210. Can you get a different temperature pressure relief valve higher than 150 PSI? Yes, actually. They look the same, they install the same, and you can get them up to 170 or whatever. There's different ranges. So let me tell you what plumbers used to do. And please, plumbers, don't do this anymore. They would come to a water heater and see that the temperature pressure relief valve has opened up, 150 PSI max. So they would take out that temperature pressure relief valve and put in a temperature pressure relief valve that is up to 170 PSI. It stops the leak, but it does leave that tank vulnerable to higher pressures than it was designed for. And I have seen tanks rupture because this temperature pressure relief valve was not rated for the tank. So when code says 150 PSI max, let's stick to that, shall we? Coming from the temperature pressure relief valve is going to be a discharge pipe and 504.6 gives us 14 important points about the installation of this discharge pipe. Let's go through them quickly. Number one, it's not to be directly connected to the drainage system. So this is an indirect waste. Number two, discharge through an air gap. Number three, not smaller than the diameter of the outlet of the valve served. So three quarter is typically the size that needs to stay three quarter all the way down. Number four, serve a single relief device and shall not connect to piping serving any other relief device. This means we don't pipe these together from one water heater to another. They each need their own. Number five, it should discharge to the floor, to a pan, or to a storage tank, or to a waste receptor, or to the outdoors. That gives us a variety of places that we can deliver that water to, but we need a place of disposal. Number six, it should discharge in a manner that does not cause personal injury or structural damage. Thank you. This way, when I'm walking up to it and it's going off and letting hot water out, I'm not going to be hurt. Number seven, it should discharge to a termination point that is readily observable by the building occupants. The fact is, you should be able to see when this temperature pressure relief valve is opening and when water is being discharged because that indicates there's a problem. Number eight, this discharge pipe shall not be trapped. Number nine, it shall be installed so as to flow by gravity. It may convey water out some distance, but has to flow by gravity. Number 10, terminate not more than six inches above the floor and not less than two times the discharge pipe diameter above the floor. Two times the pipe diameter is air gap. If you remember the definition of air gap, two times pipe diameter. But we don't want this pipe cut short and just coming halfway down the water heater and spraying water all over, we could get burned as we approach. So at a maximum six inches above the floor, but at least two times the pipe diameter, which is typically about one and a half inches, two inches, okay? Number 11, shall not have a threaded connection on the end of such piping. They used to make these discharge pipes out of galvanized pipe. They'd just grab a scrap, thread it, throw it on there. If there's threads on the bottom and someone who doesn't know what these are notices that, they might be like, oh, it's leaking, let me just throw a cap on there. They put the cap on there and then we've significantly increased the danger of the situation because now there's no place to relieve the excess pressure. Number 12, it shall not have valves or T's. Number 13, shall be constructed of those materials listed and there are specific materials. You can't just throw whatever you want. And finally, number 14, the pipe has to be one nominal size larger than the size of the relief valve outlet where the relief valve discharge piping is installed with insert fittings. That's a long way to say, look, if you're using PEX, a barbed PEX fitting shrinks down the inside diameter. So you need to use a larger pipe if you're using PEX. 
says the outlet end of such tubing shall be fastened in place. So if you're using PEX tubing as the discharge, you have to fasten it at the bottom, put a two hole strap or something like that on it to hold it in place. Boy, a lot to remember when it comes to discharge piping, but hopefully that helps you to know what's okay and what's not. 504.7 tells us about when we will need a water heater pan under the water heater. And particularly, we need a pan when a leak from the water heater would cause damage to structure. So let's say this is a wood framed building with wood subfloors and joists. If the water gets out, it will rot the subfloor, it could damage the joists that could affect the structure that's actually holding the tank and they can fall through the floor. <laughs> Not a good situation. Whereas if the water heater is sitting on a cement floor and a floor drain nearby and it starts to leak, it's not going to damage or destroy structure. It'll make a mess, but it's not unsafe. So we put a pan under anywhere that we can recognize if this leaks, it's going to do damage. And the pan can be made of galvanized steel, aluminum, or plastic. But if it's plastic, it cannot be used under a gas fired water heater because all that gas and heat and whatever ends up affecting the plastic. It gets brittle and it doesn't last. So metal for underneath a gas fired water heater. Now the pan size and drain are specified in 504.7.1. The pan has to be one and a half inches deep. That's the minimum. And it has to have a minimum of three quarter inch drain outlet. Most of the ones I've seen are either one inch or bigger. 504.7.2 talks about the termination point for the pan drain. It says the pan drain shall extend full size and terminate over a suitably located indirect waste. So it has to go to a floor drain or something. And terminate not less than six inches and not more than 24 inches above the adjacent ground surface if it is being discharged outside. Where a pan drain was not previously installed, the pan drain shall not be required for replacement of water heater installation. So if you come behind and there has never been a water heater pan before, I, it's clear that you're in a wood structure and like, well, this should have had a pan, sheesh. Or if there's a pan there and there's no drain connection, code is saying that it, it's okay at very least to replace or keep a pan there. Better to have a pan than no pan, <laughs> even if there's not a drain. Now, most of the time, if a water heater starts to leak into the pan, and if there's not a drain, that water heater is going to pool, it's going to fill up the pan, and it's going to suffocate the water heater. It will affect the combustion to where hopefully people will find it before it overflows and leaks into the structure. Finally, section 505 talks about insulation and particularly 505.1 talks about unfired vessel insulation. Now unfired would be a storage tank. What we have here in this picture is an electric water heater and you can see the insulation around it. That's the point of this illustration. But an unfired would mean this is just a holding tank and it does have to have some insulation so that we don't just let all the heat through the tank into the room and lose that energy. R12.5 is the minimum insulation for such a storage tank. And that does it for our presentation on International Plumbing Code Chapter 5, Water Heaters. Now you know more about the requirements and the reasons why we do what we do as we install water heaters. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.